Welcome to this NPTEL Massive Open Online course and this course is on phonetics and phonology a broad overview. We have been talking about phonology, the fifth unit of this course and in the last two lectures we talked about what is phonology and uh, we have now um, gone through the basic aspects of the field and um, we now know that it studies the distribution of sounds in a language as well as interaction between sounds. And uh, phonology tackles questions such as what are predictable sounds in a language, what exactly do we mean by predictability also and what is the phonetic context and which sounds affect the meaning of words. And we also have been talking about a certain type of analysis called phonemic analysis and the goal of the phonemic analysis is to produce a minimal set of phonemes for the language and it will be the smallest set of sounds in that language with the set of phonemes every utterance can be analyzed phonetically and we also looked at phonological rules in the last lecture and uh, we looked at the set of sounds that uh, a rule applies to and a particular phonetic feature or a set of features. And we also looked at something called natural classes which we will be um, repeating in the next few classes and I am trying to understand natural class in greater detail. A natural class of sounds uh, is any complete set of sounds in a given language and that share the same value for a feature or a set of features. And suppose a language has uh, three nasals, then the feature will be plus nasal because they constitute the complete set of sounds in that language. That language may be either Maasai or English. And or T and uh, T and K form a natural class in Maasai in, in English because they constitute stop and plus stop and minus voice sounds. So, uh, this idea of uh, natural classes is, uh, is very important in phonology and we will require this idea for all types of phonological analysis and in um, this lecture we will not particularly deal with natural classes and features although uh, that is important to be kept in mind and in the next lecture we will deal with uh, this particular idea, the concept of natural classes. Uh, in greater detail. So, uh, let us now uh, look at uh, phonemes, something which we uh, looked at in the last lecture and we are continuing with that. So, um, we talked about the psychological reality of the phoneme, we talked about uh, contrastiveness, how a contrast in one language, if it is there as a phonemic contrast in one language and an allophonic contrast in another language or if it is um, if the contrast is there among different consonants then that may not suppose dentals and alveolars in um, in English. English has dental fricatives but English does not have dental stops but suppose there is a language X maybe this is a dialect of Bengali which is both dental and alveolar sounds and both dental and alveolar stops. So, if an English speaker who sometimes produces dental stops because of an environment is hears these distinctions then they will not be able to make out the contrast even though allophonically those sounds may appear in um, her dialect, in her uh, dialect suppose a variety of American English. And hence, a speaker A has a contrast which is there in the language phonemically and that is why the speaker hears the distinction. Speaker B has those sounds in the language but they appear allophonically but the speaker will not be able to distinguish the two sounds. So, this is the psychological reality of phonemes. The phonemes are psychologically real, not the allophones. So, speaker A was unable to hear the Bengali dental alveolar distinction because speaker's A native language does not have a phonemic contrast between alveolars and dental stops. So, um, they are pretty much uh, the distinction is inaudible even though the speaker might speak it in her variety as an allophonic variant, the sound may be there. So, 
Um, contrastiveness of two phonetically similar sounds leads speakers of the language to focus their perceptual attention on the contrasting sounds and fail to hear other distinctions which the speaker may produce allophonically. Native speakers hear the differences between phonemes, but not between allophones. This idea of the same sound of the psychological reality of phonemes is can be uh, seen in other uh, examples as well. So, groups of mutually non-distinctive sounds are grouped together into categories that is the phonemes. So, speakers usually believe that two allophones of the same phoneme are the same sound. So, um, in English in 10 the phoneme a occurs before a nasal sound and that is why we have a distinction between 10 and ted uh, and then uh, vowel nasalization is a rule in English. So, for English speakers then a and a they are the same uh, vowels. However, it may not be so in French and this much we have uh, seen in the last lecture. And uh, now, um, talking about foreign accents and um, transfer, we also said that uh, we will look at foreign accents. So, what happens when a speaker internalizes rules that derive the various allophones in their appropriate environments? The behavior of speakers attempting to produce the sounds of a language new to them, a uh, foreign accent persists even after years of practice. And the phenomenon of mispronunciations in ways attributable to the phonology is always called transfer. Uh, transfer is to consider a phonology as specifying the set of things that are pronunciable in a given context. So, this set consists of legal sequences of phonemes realized as the appropriate allophones for the context. So, in the last lecture we looked at what is illegal sequence in English and if a word of a foreign language is phonologically illegal in English for uh, any of the reasons that we had uh, discussed in the last lecture. So, it will not be pronounced correctly by English speakers. So, uh, hence we have this derivation of nasalization if, um, if a native speaker encounters nasal vowel in a language like French in an English accent. So, both the vowel and the consonant here as we saw in tant where the n is particularly short n we would hear what we hear hearing is that uh, English speaker producing the French word in such a way that it is in um, sort of a sequence of allophones of the uh, particular language that is English and not exactly the way um, that a French speaker would hear uh, would consider that to be a phoneme. So, then now we can express these derivations as such. So, vowel becomes a nasal if there is a following plus nasal and um, this particular aspect of nasal um, consonant shortening which comes along with the fact that the vowel is nasalized in the English accent. Uh, what exactly happens there? If a consonant is um, nasal it becomes short in the environment where uh, there is a voiceless consonant. This is the environment where in English uh, the nasal is shorter in because there is a following voiceless consonant and we therefore, we have the sequence of allophones in the English accent and not exactly what is to be found in French. So, um, the idea of psychological reality of the phoneme comes from uh, this paper exactly with the same name, the psychological reality of the phoneme written by uh, Sapir. And um, Sapir argues that the phonemic attitude is more basic psychologically speaking than uh, the more strictly phonetic one, then it should be possible to detect it in the unguarded speech judgments of native speakers, naive speakers who have a complete control of their language in a practical sense, but have no rationalized or con consciously systematic knowledge of it. Errors of analysis or what the sophisticated onlooker is liable to consider as such may be expected to occur. Uh, which have the characteristic of being phonetically unsound or inconsistent, but which at the same time register a feeling for what is phonemically accurate. And so, what does this mean? Uh, this extended quote means that the phonemes are more real for the naive speakers, which means the linguistically untrained speakers. Speakers have awareness of the language's phonemes, but they are unaware of its 
allophones even though the allophones can be scientifically objectively examined. Now, um, another example that uh, Sapir gives from his uh, field work is that of this if is the sudden uh, Paiute example. In sudden Paiute an extinct Uto Aztecan language of Utah and um, Arizona, Sapir asked his sudden Paiute informant to transcribe a word he pronounced as uh, Paba with a voice bilabial fricative between the intervocal kili. Uh, Sapir was um, surprised to see his informant write um, uh, the word as Papa and the uh, speaker of sudden Paiutis wrote per when Sapir heard v. Why exactly was that so? The sound really is v, yet the speaker is unconscious of this phonetics fact. The speaker pr pronounces the, word, the sound in a certain way, but transcribes it in another way. Why is this so? In this language, the consonants per and ver, ver are not phonemes, but allophones of per. Ver occurs after vowels and per occurs in all other positions. So, ver and per are allophones of the same phoneme, not different, not different phonemes. So, the basic phoneme is per. Now, here is another example of a psychological reality of phoneme like the um, dental alveolar example that we had given before that the speaker of a language cannot hear distinctions uh, which are um, not there phonemically. Here the speaker cannot hear even the allophones produced um, by himself in his own language. And then uh, we have uh, also Sapir gives another example of Sarsi, an Athabascan language spoken in Alberta, Canada. And Sapir encountered a similar problem that we often do when analyzing languages. The word pronounced as Dini has uh, two meanings. And um, this one and it makes a sound. Uh, Sapir was certain that the words were the same but his informant I was not sure that the words were the same and in informant kept on saying that these are different words. And um, in Sapir's own words, quote, he answered without hesitation that they were quite different, unquote. In fact, he said that the sound ends in a T though no T is audibly present there. He, quote, claimed that he felt a T in the syllable yet when he tested it over and over to himself, he had to admit that he could neither hear a T nor feel his tongue articulating one. And um, when we add the affix e to both words, this one does not change, but it makes the sound changes to the e t with the hidden or latent t suddenly appearing. The word for it makes a sound has a final t that is preserved before suffixes, but it is silent in other contexts. And so phonologically, Sapir's informant was correct, but what Sapir heard was the rendition of the word which was available for analysis at an objective level. So, the two words uh, the ni has two meanings, but uh, for the speaker uh, of the language these are uh, two different words. The t that we do not hear at all or is not even produced by the speaker is actually um, the in the speaker's organization, mental organization that sound is there even though it is not produced. So, phonologically Sapir's informant was correct, but what Sapir heard was also correct and but these are two different levels that we keep talking about. One is the phonetic level, one is the phonological level of the mental organization of sounds. And the Nootka example, Nootka spoken uh, on Vancouver Island, British Columbia uh, has a writing system which was developed by Alex Thomas who is the native speaker of Nootka. And uh, many features of this writing system show the importance of analogy or phonetics in writing systems uh, which generally happens. In Nootka, A and E are in complementary distribution and A occurs after her and E occurs everywhere else. So, Alex Thomas writes uh, E for A, um, that is the rule is um, A goes to E in the environment where there is a preceding so, um, basically you know, the underlying form is he and then uh, which becomes he because of the preceding her. 
There is also an English example from, from Sapir's paper on the psychological reality of the phoneme. Sapir's students took dictation of nonsense words that Sapir pronounced when, uh, and these are English speaking students. When he said a nonsense words like sme, students would write it down as sme with a final glottal stop. Why? The reason is in the phonology of English. In English, lax vowels uh, like a, do not occur in final position. So, in English, either tense vowels, tense vowels, long vowels, or consonants occur in final positions in monosyllabic words. Of course, in disyllabic words, the phonotactic rules are different. So, in monosyllabic words, either tense vowels in final position. In final position, there are either tense vowels, long vowels, or consonants. Lax vowels in monosyllables um, never occur in English. So, um, we have vowels like T or um, C, etc., long vowels or tense vowels, or um, consonants like sit or um, a bit, etc., but a lax vowel like A or O short or lax uh, will never uh, occur in English in that position. So, uh, in the phonology, in the speaker's uh, phonology, uh, this is not a possible word and hence, even when, when Sapir says the words may, this, the writer would hear this may because it is not possible to uh, have a lax final vowel in English. So, uh, the knowledge of the sound system of our native language determines not only how we perceive that language, but also other languages and also extends to everything that we hear around us. We use the phonology of our languages to hear um, uh, the sounds around us. Now that we have understood a bit about um, phonemes, uh, the phonological organization of sounds in our minds the psychological reality of phonemes. Let us also look at some other things concerning uh, phonemic analysis, uh, the criterion of phonemic phonetic similarity. Uh, in some cases, collecting and arranging the non-contrasting phonetic segments is insufficient as in ha and ng in English. So, uh, ha occurs, now we are looking at phonemic analysis, um, which we have been looking at. The uh, idea that phonological analysis of a language involves finding out the phonemes of that, uh, of that language. So, let us look at a few things regarding phonemes and the problems that we have in a phonemic analysis. So, ha and ng in English, uh, ha occurs at the beginning of words and before stress vowels. The sound ng occurs at the end of words before consonants and between vowels of which the second is stressless. So, uh, we get um, sing or sink or a pang or anger or dinghy or stringopore. Now, there are no cases of ha occurring at ends of words, so before consonants or between vowels of which the second is stressless. So, basically, we do not find the kind of contrastive distribution that we are talking about to find phonemes. Likewise, there are no cases of ng occurring at the beginning of word or before a stressed vowel. Therefore, if we look at the distribution of ha and nga, they do not contrast. So, um, given that, why is this important? Given that our idea of un our understanding of phonemic analysis is that contrast is the most basic aspect of this analysis of this type of analysis. So, but we have now phonemes in a language like English, which we understand because it is uh, widely studied. We now see that uh, from a very um, commonly occurring words that ha and nga do not contrast. And since ha and nga do not contrast, should we regard them as allophones of a single phoneme? And uh, so, from the phonologist's traditional answer would be no, simply because when two sounds are allophones the same of the same phoneme, they will be felt by native speakers as the same sound, and which we now know clearly from that part of the lecture where we looked at the psychological reality of phonemes. And this is clearly not the case for ha and nga. And thus, the idea of phonemes can be established purely on distributional grounds um, is rejected. So, on distributional grounds, ha and nga 
cannot be considered to be phonemes, but for all other purposes, for all other um, intents and purposes, ha, um, ha and ha are phonemes, they are not the same sound. So, speakers will reject them as same sound. And how do we come to the conclusion that they are not um, allophones, but phonemes and it does not come from distributional grounds, it comes from the speaker's uh, intuition. So, the basic idea that we had initially said that we have to find phonemes from the distribution, we have to find the complementary distribution uh, gives us uh, allophones that is um, not correct. So, if we look at complementary distribution, then these um, uh, ha and uh, the two sounds are not found in um, to contrast at all. Contour segments and uh, the segment sequence problem. Sounds like uh, diphthongs, fricatives and pre stops are often called uh, contour segments. And um, another, this is another problem in phonemicization that double sounds or uh, contour segments, uh, they have two phonetic qualities in sequence, but often treated phonologically as a single sound. A recognition of contour segments is an analytic difficulty faced in phonemicization. So, we need to decide whether I should be treated as diphthong or as a sequence of I and E and cha as an affricate, um, as cha or da and cha and pre nasalized stops as nasal plus stop sequences. This analytical issue is called the segment sequence problem and this problem is easy to solve if there is an actual contrast uh, between uh, segment and uh, sequence. And um, cha as an affricate is uncontroversial because it contrasts with the stop uh, plus fricative sequence cha. So, in uh, Polish uh, chi as a uh, tree or the other uh, fricative sequence, this one is affricate and this is a fricative sequence. And in Polish they are phonetically different. So, this is the affricate and this is the sequence and they are phonetically different and ch is longer than this ch. The contrast between monosegmental ch and bisegmental ch um, could not be uh, expressed. So, thus the Afri affricate ch must be analyzed as a segmental single segmental um, unit in Polish. So, Polish has both the mono uh, segmental and the bisegmental and this is uh, another a problem because it is difficult to tease apart these two parts in the in a phonemicization approach. And Mandarin has the following sounds a, e, u, a, and o, and a and o never occur alone but only as a part of the diphthongs a and o. Um, so, one possible phonemicization is that these are the underlying forms, and because of vowel assimilation, a goes to a. In the context where there is a following e, and then vowel assimilation to a uh, goes to o in the context where there is u, and then we have the surface forms um, a, a, o, u. In this analysis, we can get by just three phonemes to derive five sounds. Since assimilation is a common process in phonology, this rule makes sense as assimilation rules. The vowel a is assimilated to e or u and becomes phonetically more similar to its neighbor. And uh, when a borrowed sound is used for the very first time by, by a single speaker, it cannot count as a phoneme of the uh, language. With time, borrowed sounds come to be used by a large number of speakers and eventually they are felt by native speakers to be an integral part of the language. The difficulty for phonological analysis is that the process is gradual. And in Jap Japanese, for instance, the voiceless bilabial fricative was plainly an allophone of her. It occurred only in the environment uh, followed by u and was in complementary distribution with ha. Ha occurred in most other environments and thus was the elsewhere allophone. Under the influence of English and other foreign language, per has extended its usage to be the usual uh, way to approximate a foreign fur sound. And this is the issue with regard to borrowed sounds and by very first time by single speaker, then it cannot count as a phoneme, but gradually larger number of speakers use this and it may uh, gain the status of phoneme, but that is an in between stage which is a problem for phonemicization. Uh, phonemicization for per and her versus her, uh, before r we have phyto, 
for fight versus haiku and and we have a uh, peruto and we have a chiffon and considering the words in the left uh, so these words with the fur and to be the uh, authentic words in the vocabularies of innovating speakers, we must say that dialect spoken by these speakers has acquired a new phoneme. Uh, this simply after promoting fur from allophone to phoneme status. So, hence there can be those in between stages where um, an allophone uh, can slowly gradually move to a phoneme status. In phonology, free variation uh, takes uh, two forms. Uh, the phenomenon of phonological uh, doublets, one word has two phonemic forms. Example, in many uh, people's speech, the word envelope can be pronounced as either envelope, uh, envelope or uh, envelope. Phonological doublets have one listing for their syntactic properties and meaning, but more than one phoneme. So, we have um, now uh, phonological doublets, one word has two phonemic forms and we have this kind of free variation which as we know is not determined by context. So, phonological doublets also occur increasing the problems in phonemic analysis where um, we have the same meaning uh, and uh, two sounds which are not determined by the context. When a single phoneme representation gives rise to more than one phonetic form, this is called free variation. In American English, the vowel phoneme A has a diphthongal allophone, which are these. So, let us see the diphthongal allophone. We have the A and A. So, in lap versus lap and pal and, and pack versus man and Spanish and dance, we have um, two types of ways in which you are pronouncing the allophone, the nasalized allophone and in one it is a diphthongal allophone and the other it is a singleton allophone. So, if an n follows a there are two outputs. So, one is this and the um, other is this. So, otherwise the allophone is uh, just a. So, nasalization is seen on both um, this and this as a consequence of vowel nasalization. The free variation between one of thongal and diphthongal allophones can be expressed with a rule which is which says that a can become a when there is a following n. The phoneme a is realizes uh, a when it precedes n. Uh, together with vowel nasalization a diphthongization su suffices to derive these variants. Uh, the speaker may apply the rule or not and diphthongization applies optionally. So, what we have to remember is that because of free variation, this is not always uh, pronounced exactly, the context does not always determine that this is exactly the way it is going to be pronounced and hence it applies optionally. The effects of optional rules can be shown with branching derivations which include arrows to indicate what happens when an optional rule does or does not apply. So, we have this form of vowel nasalization. So, this it could be either this or this as the two surface forms of ban. Okay. So, if there is diphthongization and then we have nasalization and then we have this form and if we do not have any diphthongization we just have vowel nasalization in these two forms. So, these optional rules um, can be shown like this. Um, other examples are related to um, phonemic contrast as um, uh, we can see in this example from Toba Batak. So, phonemic contrast is often not an across the board matter, uh, but is confined to a uh, particular context. So, we have a pino par, uh, this is Toba Batak, we have a contrast between voice and voiceless stops and affricates and we see um, these voiceless stops and we see these voice stops. So, and occurring in exactly the same position. So, we have Tuak versus Dukar, we have Korea versus Garut, we have Pino uh, Par versus Biang. So, in similar environments, we have uh, both Pa and Ba, Ta and Da and Ka and Ga. So, gi giving us the idea that these are phonemes. Many words of Toba Batak also end in voiceless stops. So, we have Pa, we have um, Surat letter and halak for man. No word in language ever ends in a voice stop. 
So we have a phonological contrast for voicing as we saw from these examples Pataka and Badaga contrasting, but it is a contextually limited contrast which means that um, this contrast is limited to a context. It can only occur in this word initial position or immediate word medial position. In word final position, we will always get voiceless stops. So, this is called a contextually limited contrast and that is another aspect of phonotactics. And how do we analyze such um, contextually limited contrast? Of uh, this is called final devoicing. So, we can express it as stop becoming voiceless in the word final position. Stops are devoiced at the end of a word. And phonological theory involves not just rules but also constraints, which we will not study, um, not look at in the lectures so much. But it is one of the very standard approaches in phonology of using constraints instead of rules. A constraint is a formal characterization of a structure that is illegal in a particular language. So, a constraint against final voice stops, it says that it is you cannot have a voice stop in a word final position. And such constraints are sometimes called phonotactic constraints. What are phonotactic constraints? Phonotactics are a general term for a principle or phonological well formedness in a particular language. And contextually limited contrast and phonotactics. Um, show a few other things also like contrast with zero. The notion of phonological contrast can be broadened to include contrast with zero. English con allows contrast like tax versus uh, tack. So, the S of tax is said to be in contrast with zero because a zero a null is a symbol representing the null string. So, contrast with zero can be contextually limited. In Toba Batak um, never permits two consonants to occur at the end of a word like English in the example he given here. In, um, in Toba Batak, um, consonants may contrast with zero only when they are adjacent to a vowel. To ban uh, CC versus C contrast in final position, we formulate either a rule or a constraint. And uh, continuing it phonotactics, which looks at the organization of sounds in a language, to ban the consonant cluster versus consonant singleton consonant contrast in final position, we formulate either a rule or a constraint. Now, look at the rule given here which says C goes to null if it is in the final position, delete a word final consonant if a consonant precedes, ban on final clusters, do not have clusters, delete them if they occur finally. Comparing the two approaches, we see one possible objection to the rule based theory. It often forces us to make arbitrary analytic decisions. There seems to be no reason to delete the second consonant after the first. Both rules would suffice to enforce the uh, one consonant limit. So, often there is further evidence from the language that tells us which rule is correct. There is no need for the two rules. So, now, we can see that apart from rules, we also need constraints in a language so, and the constraint that we see here is a constraint saying ban on final clusters. In analyzing a language, we seek first to isolate its inventory of phonemes. The allophonic variation of phonemes both contextual and free must be characterized with appropriate phonological rules. And the limitations on contrast be both between phonemes and between phonemes and zero must be characterized with rules or constraints. And we saw the rules, we also saw constraints like avoid ban on fin final consonant clusters. And both rules and constraints um, are have been used in phonological analysis and there have been approaches which use only constraints, there have been approaches which use only rules and all that is a part of the formal phonological theory. Now, well, let us look a, a bit at one of the standard approaches of uh, in rule based um, approaches of analyzing a phonemic uh, f uh, problem, a phonological problem. So, uh, this is how things proceed that first we have a phonemic underlying representation which undergoes phonological rules. And then we have a phonetic representation as a result of the application of those rules. 
phonological rules translate and give us the surface phonetic representation from the phonemic representation. And uh, phonological rules show predictable properties of pronunciation. It shows first we have to find the basic sounds. Then uh, once the rule is applied, we get the result of the application of the rule. And finally, the environment that A goes to B in the context C, A changes to B in environment C, which we actually saw in the beginning of this lecture on phonemes. So, what are the important questions in phonology now that we have had uh, uh, quite a bit of introduction to the field? So, what are the phonemes of a given language? That is a very important question. How are they distributed? What constitutes the phonemes? Almost most questions in phonology are based on, um, uh, on these simple questions and um, how to solve a phonology problem. So, look at a very basic phonological problem and um, we will look at more complicated examples in the next few classes, we will look at natural classes etcetera, but for the time being we will look at a basic analytical uh, problem. So, uh, are there minimal pairs? Are some of the sounds predictable? Natural class and morphology add more complexity to the questions that are asked in the phonological problem, but for the time being we will look at only a simple problem. So, how to solve a phonology problem? How to find out if two sounds in a particular language are phonemes or allophones given a set of data from that language? If two sounds are allophones of the same phoneme, how, how do we express this? And we have already seen that actually in the beginning of this lecture, but we will go through this again and see the step by step analysis to see how we analyze a phonological problem. So, given two sounds A and B and a set of data in language x, we have to determine if A and B are separate phonemes in x or allophones of the same phoneme in x. In order to analyze this, we have to follow certain steps. So, we have two sounds A and B and we have a set of data uh, and we have to determine if A and B are phonemes or allophones. So, what do we do when we are given that problem? Some uh, diagnostic tests as um, discussed before before in the last lecture also these were discussed, but we will proceed step by step to, to see a problem first hand uh, now. So, minimal pairs, first thing that we have to look at is minimal pairs. Contrastive distribution is what we are trying to um, find. So, we are trying to find minimal pairs that is two words which have different meanings and which are contrastive for the given sound. So, suppose we, ha we have a language x and we have two, we are asked to find out if pa and ba are two, two um, are allophones in this language or phonemes and we have two words in this language, one is pim and one is bim. So, we have found our minimal pair, we can be sure that these two and, and suppose pim means cat and bim means dog, this is language x. Then in this language we are pretty much sure now that pa and ba are two phonemes. So, uh, that is minimal pairs and predictability complementary distribution if complementary then the sounds are allophones of the same phoneme. Suppose in language there is language y and we ask to find out if pa and ba are phonemes or elephants. And we have two sounds here, we have um, pim and we have, uh, we do not find bim in this language. Instead, we find that in this language, we find um, ibim, which is um, and in this context in the word initial position, we do not find ba at all in this language. So, this complementary distribution is then obvious, if this contrastive distribution is not there, then we find this the distribution is complementary and then if the sound if, if complementary, then the sounds are allophones of the same phoneme. If so, we state the phonological environments. And uh, so, let us look at uh, some data here from a language called uh, Mokilis and the data is between voice and voiceless vowels, two high vowels, one voice, one voiceless, one voice, one voiceless, the voiceless shown with the diacritic right below the vowel. So, we have 
Now, uh, Poki versus Pisan, we have Pil versus uh, Kisa, we have Apid versus Kamwa Kiti, we have Uduk versus Puko, and we have Lujuk versus Shupo, we have Tupukta versus Kamwa Kiti. Now, what do we do first? Uh, first, are E and U um, voiced and voiceless uh, separate phonemes or different allophones of the same phoneme in Mokilis? State your evidence. So, this is our distribution for E and U for the voiceless E and U. So, it is it occurs between P and S, between K and S and K and T, U between P and K and S and P. Now, for E U, we find all these diverse environments. Now, what is the commonality in this environment that we find the voiceless vowel in? Yeah, the, as you can hear the way I say it is a whispery vowel he occurs between voiceless consonants occurs between voiceless consonants. So, no natural class can be used to define where E and U occur. So, this cannot be defined in natural this is however voiceless and voiceless. If you can determine the environments in which each sound occurs, then you also have to decide which one is underlying, which is derived. The sound that appears in different environments is mostly the one which represents the underlying phoneme or the basic uh, sound. This is where we find the diverse environments. And as you can see, the diverse environment is word final between consonants, one voice, one voiceless, word initial between voice and voiceless, word initial, between voice and voice, uh, voiceless and word final. These are diverse environments unlike this where it is consistently between two voiceless sounds. So, uh, E occur does not occur where he does and vice versa, U does not occur where who does and vice versa. So, why does U does not occur where who occurs? Who occurs between voiceless consonants? He occurs between voiceless consonants. That in those contexts, E and U never occur. So, they are in complementary distribution. He and E are in complementary distribution. Who and U are too. And the third step now we discover generalizations. We discover generalizations and state them in simple terms. E and U are voiceless when they occur between voiceless consonants. E and U are voiced elsewhere. So, what is the Mokili's rule? The Mokili's rule is that E and U become he and U between voiceless consonants or we can simplify it further and say that high vowels become voiceless between voiceless consonants. So, um, to end this lecture on phonology where, where we started with the idea of the of psychological reality of phoneme, we discussed phonotactics, we discussed how some constraints are needed sometimes instead of rules and we also discussed some issues with regard to the phonemic analysis. Finally, we saw, we see a step by step analysis of a phonology problem. So, what do we do phonology problem? We determine the identity of the phonemes and the allophones. What is the basic sound and which are the restricted allophones? And the form that occurs in a wide variety of phonemic environments is most likely to be the underlying form. And the form that is restricted in its occurrence to particular context is the derived form. The underlying form thus is typically referred to as the elsewhere form. So, here hence what occurs in the diverse environments here are the voiced uh, vowels and therefore, we can state our rule as plus high plus um, high vowels become voiceless minus voice in the environment where there are two um, minus voice consonants in both sides. So, this is how we write a rule, this is how we analyze phonological problems. Thank you for your attention and we will continue with more issues in phonology in the next class. Thank you.